Good evening, everyone. Um, Tom's here to talk about um, A la Rob Grier. Um, this is uh, one of the events in the French Institute's uh, uh, French Passions series. Um, and the idea is that an English writer talks about how a French writer's inspired them. There's one more to come, which is Kate Moss on Maupassant on the 7th of July. Um, but uh, Tom um, tonight's going to talk about Rob Grier and uh, a little bit about him. I hope you all know about his three fantastic novels. Um, the first was Remainder, which was uh, originally published by uh, an art press in Paris uh, and then published uh, in the UK and in America and um, uh, worldwide. And then um, Men in Space um, and finally last year, uh, Sea. Uh, and in the meantime, Tom has constantly busy with many, many other projects and teachers and all sorts of um, fantastic subjects. Um, and there's an I think with, with some uh, interest on, in, the, in questions that I think Tom might talk about later and authenticity and inauthenticity, there's an ongoing project and he's the president of a, an organization called the International Necronautical Society, uh, which I think was described in its manifesto uh, as a semi-fictitious organization. And uh, I mean, it's not that it's sort of only semi-fictitious. I, I, I've been to their events and I got a press badge and I thought that was very exciting. So uh, it it's kind of really exists and um, he might tell you more about it. Um, but in the meantime, Rob Grier, and I think, Tom, it would be nice to, if you started by telling us a little bit about how you came across him and uh, what he did for you and, and why and where you began. And okay, well... Um I, I first read Rob Grier, I, guess, I think I've, I read In the Labyrinth first when I was still a student and um, this, it's an amazing book, it, it, it's, it's, it's not really about anything, I mean it, it, what happens in it is a bunch of kind of staggered repetitions of, of a soldier going through streets and into a bar and into a room and then it switches to another kind of level of the same event of a soldier going through streets and into a bar and into a room and there's this movement kind of towards death um and it's just completely kind of hypnotic and and uh but i got the impression then i mean this rob greer was kind of a a marker for me for for a kind of you know for a literature that mattered and and what it had to do and the type of parameters it had to have and what it had to reject in order to matter you know, I mean, he wasn't the only one. He's part of a whole kind of interconnected, you know, swathe or army of figures. But he's a very important one. And and um, anyhow, yeah. Then later, I mean, in my twenties, I was living in in Berlin and and just trying to. I read several more of his books and just tried to work out like how how does he do that? You know, how do you how do you make a nouveau roman? And um, and that's really how I, you know, he, he just, he, he's always been this kind of really important, yeah, marker of, of what, what, of the project, you know, what needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so you, you, were, you were there in your 20s trying to figure out how, how it worked. Yeah. And yeah. Um, are, are there any pictures here? I, got, I brought some kind of, this kind of cute, crappy set of drawings I did. I mean, there's one of his early, there's one of his very short stories. It's only three pages long. It's called The Dressmaker's Dummy. And if you read it n not very carefully, it looks really boring because nothing happens in it. There's just a room with a mirror and a dummy and a table. And, and you might think, so what? But actually, if you really read it carefully, I mean, he, you know, I'll read you the first couple of sentences. I, mean, I just numbered each sentence. So one, the number's gone, but basically the one on the far left, it just said, the coffee pot is on the table. That's it. So I drew a coffee pot on a table. Two is, it is a four-legged round table covered with a waxy oil cloth patterned in red and gray squares against a neutral background of yellowish white that may have been formerly ivory colored or white. In the center, a square ceramic tile serves as a protective base. Its design is entirely hidden or at least made unrecognizable by the coffee pot placed upon it. So that's two. 
then three describes its theory. It slowly builds up sentence by sentence. It tells you there's a, du- a mannequin in the room, a window, a mirror in which another mirror from a chest of drawers is, is, um, you know, is doubled. Outside there are trees that you can only see doubled in the double mirror. And of course the dummy is double doubled as well. And um, what's the next one? Then it gets really, really interesting. I mean, uh, but by, by, numbers, by sentence 16, you've got a kind of pretty full picture of what the room looks like. Um, it says, the room is quite bright, blah, 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 good smell of hot coffee. The dressmaker's dummy is no longer in its accustomed spot. It is normally placed in the corner by the window opposite the mirrored wardrobe. The wardrobe has been placed in its position to help with the fittings. By number 16, you've kind of, you know what the room looks like. You feel that you've got everything. And then there's this incredible final sentence that just says, the design on the ceramic tile base is the picture of an owl with two large, somewhat frightening eyes. But for the moment, it cannot be made out because of the coffee pot. In other words, like the climax of the whole story is a blind spot. It's all about what you can see, surfaces, reflections, angles. You know, which, which initial, the first wave of readers, readers kind of said, oh, Rob Gray, he's so weird, it's trippy, it's subjective. But it's not at all. This is totally realistic. This is how space and matter and surfaces, you know, if we walked into this room, this is how we'd actually perceive it. But what's amazing is that, yeah, it culminates in a blind spot, which is a gaze that comes straight back at us, and it's frightening and kind of animalistic. So it's this is kind of violence at the core of it. And I think all of his work operates on those principles. So violence is there, but there are no people there. Um, yeah. So perhaps you could explain something about why um, uh, the, 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 the lack of people, but the presence of violence, and what it was that drew yeah. you to... to I mean, th- th- there are people there. In order for the room to be there, there has to be someone perceiving it. I mean, there has to be a point of perception. Um, and, and, and there is, it's all about consciousness in space. Um, this is what all of his work is about. So in his real masterpiece, I think, the um, La Jalousie, the jealousy or the blind, it's kind of untranslatable. Um, you, you don't see the protagonist either. There kind of is no protagonist. It's just this gaze stalking a house, going down its corridor. It's very like Lynch's um, Lost Highway, the opening sequence there, just moving down the corridors looking at the geometry of walls and angles and mirrors and, and blinds, jalousy, and looking at a woman through it who's maybe going to be killed. Um, but again, you know, there's this kind of violent psychosis lurking at, at the heart of it, which all revolves around, around the blind spot. Um, yeah. so, so I think, you know, t- that there are people in it. It's all about consciousness. It's all about the, the basic real building blocks of consciousness and subjectivity, which is <laughs> desire and repetition and and so on but but what it completely bypasses and this is why it was so attractive to me when i started reading it it bypasses all the kind of sentimental humanist bullshit you know <laughs> of character and depth and emotion and you know i mean it, it it just it goes straight to what kind of matters yeah you know and we'll talk about the the absence of all those things but on the surface although uh, it might take you a little while before you get into that when you when you read jealousy uh, there 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 are there are two figures there one of whom is is this woman in the house who who might be brushing her hair and she's seen from various angles and at the same time there's a there's a neighbor and the question is who's looking, as you were yeah. saying, um, always. Um, so uh, I wondered if you could, you, would it, be, it would be nice if you could li- read a little passage from it. Okay, um, well, we'd, uh, Helen mentioned it would be nice to choose a passage, so I chose this passage that um, the woman doesn't die in jealousy. The whole thing is set up in a quite 19th century way. I mean, there's, it's a love triangle the gaze that moves around the house, you can kind of reverse engineer it and say, well, this is the husband, and and it is. I mean, it's the master of the house moving around, watching his wife negotiating an affair with the neighbor on these banana plantations in the the French Caribbean or or French Africa, colonial Africa. And, um, and, um, And it keeps leading up to her murder, but this event kind of doesn't happen. But what does happen, it's displaced onto this poor centipede that's on the wall of the kitchen that is killed again and again and again. The moment of its death keeps being kind of replayed. So I thought I'd read one of its many deaths. Um, 
And again, it's just, it's so typical. It's this kind of animalistic violence that, that produces, you know, a significance to space. I mean, we, should, we could talk about that in a minute. Okay, so, um, dum, dum, dum. A turns back, the wife is just called A, dot, dot, dot. Her, her very name has an ellipse in it, a kind of blind spot. A dot, 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 turns back so that she is looking straight ahead. A centipede, she says in a more restrained voice in the silence that has just fallen. Franck looks up again. Following the direction of A dot, dot, dot's motionless gaze, he turns his head to the other side towards his right. On the light-colored paint of the partition opposite A dot, 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 a common scutigera of average size, about as long as a finger, has appeared easily, that's the centipede, easily seen despite the dim light. It is not moving for the moment, but the orientation of its body indicates the path which cuts across the panel diagonally, coming from the skirting board on the hallway side and heading towards the corner of the ceiling. The creature is easy to identify thanks to the development of its legs, especially on the posterior portion. On closer examination, the swaying movement of the antennae at the other end can be discerned. A dot 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 has not moved since her discovery, sitting very straight in her chair, her hands resting flat on the cloth on either side of her plate. Her eyes are wide, staring at the wall. Her mouth is not quite closed and may be quivering imperceptibly. It is not unusual to encounter different kinds of centipedes after dark in this, in the, in this already old wooden house. And this kind is not one of the largest. It is far from being one of the most venomous. A does her best, but does not manage to look away nor to smile at the joke about her aversion to centipedes. Franck, who has said nothing, is looking at A again. Then he stands up noiselessly, holding his napkin in, the, in his hand. He wads it into a ball and approaches the wall. A seems to be breathing a little faster, but this may be an illusion. Her left hand gradually closes over her knife. The delicate antennae accelerate their alternate swaying. Suddenly, the creature hunches its body and begins descending diagonally towards the ground as fast as its long legs can go, while the wadded napkin falls on it faster still. The hand with the tapering fingers has clenched around the knife handle, but the features of the face have lost none of their rigidity. Franck lifts the napkin away from the wall and with his foot continues to squash something on the tiles against the skirting board. About a yard higher, the paint is marked with a dark shape a tiny arc twisted into a question mark, blurred on one side, in places surrounded by more tenuous signs from which A has still not taken her eyes. Very nice, thank you. The, um, besides the, the, the brutal bit, that's one thing persistent in that passage is uh, all the directions and shapes and All of his work is so full of diagonals, quinquanxes, yeah. trape trapezoids, and I mean, he, he writes about this in his kind of set of essays on writing and towards a new novel, or that were gathered together into what towards a new novel. He's very against. I mean, he's a total anti-humanist. He he hates anthropocentrism. He he hates the kind of sentimentalization of the universe that you get through imbuing objects with character. So he sees geometry as a way of. Of, of kind of preventing that. You know, don't describe a table as sorrowful or meek. Just say what its diameter is and, you know, how many legs it's got and how far apart from each other they are. And, and, and he does that, you know, with absolute persistency throughout all of his work. I mean, it's completely forensic, you know. Yeah. It's in, but in it's, it's not simply a business of saying exactly what things look like and they are, therefore, this shape. Um, yeah. Is it that, I mean, because they're... There's a was consistency in that passage. I mean, you mentioned the diagonals, um, uh, and it ends up with the arc and the question mark. But yeah. the diagonals are everywhere in that book and everywhere in the others too. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are sort of series of very basic, you know, yeah. school geometry type shapes it which is, yeah. obsess him. But um, but why? I mean, why? this isn't just the objects. It's um, no. I mean, th this is where violence. If, if he were just describing spaces, relations, shapes, it would indeed be boring, which is what his critics kind of say of his work. But because there's a primal violence always at the heart of it, I mean, if you think of forensic, you think of a forensic report, mm. you know, I mean, it, it, it takes, say someone shot on a, on a street corner, on a banal street corner that's no different from any other street corner, 
suddenly now all of the little measurements the 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 how high is the curb you know what's the texture of the paving what are the angles in shop windows and reflected in passing whatever phone boxes i mean this becomes incredibly significant this is like you know the calvary or you know this is like the scene of christ's own crucifixion because of that event in it and and not for nothing is is rob greer you know i mean he his first novel is a kind of thriller i mean it's all about forensic attention to, to space so i think that's that's a kind of really important thing, that, that kind of detective forensic aesthetic. But you could, I mean, also I think it goes kind of deeper than that. I mean, you know, the philosopher Denis Ollier points out that, you know, public space, civic space, the space of the polis, the city, political space, is, is produced through a primal murder. I mean, the French Republic comes out of the execution of Marie Antoinette, you know, or, or in fact, we go even further back. I mean, it, it's Greek, basically. I mean, Rob Greer is, is obsessed with, with Greece, you know, mm. and, with, and with Oedipus and, and with, and even more perhaps with the, the, the legend of the labyrinth, you know, which is the, the original architecture and geometry all these chevrons lines diagonals corridors and so on and 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 the reason the labyrinth is there is because of um you know this this primal sex crime by yeah. by europa which has to be hidden put into its own ellipse into its blind spot underneath the court underneath civic space hidden away and it demands an annual act of sacrifice i mean the sacrifice of the death of children you know and then theseus goes into it and and so with his string. I mean, that's a kind of narrative act. It's an act of reading the space and that results in another death of the Minotaur. I mean, th this, this is, I, I think, at, at base, for all the newness of the new novel, he's, a, in a way, he's an ultra-traditionalist. I mean, he's, he's going back to the Greeks yeah. and, and, and um, reanimating that in a kind of 20th century way. Yeah, and at the same time, you say that there's, um, there's another layer of it because you hinted in what you were saying there that there's... Uh, there's also the sort of policier aspect of it, so that they're all, the, or the novels of the of the of the period are, are all set in this this uh, sense that there's dark doings happening on Parisian streets, and they have to be investigated. So you mentioned his first novel. I'm not sure if it's the first one he wrote. The, the, erase. the erase. I think he wrote Regicide before, right. but it wasn't okay. published. Or I could be wrong. Um, yeah, I think it was his first published novel was The Erasers, Les Gommes. Les Gommes. Yeah. Um, and so that's um, forensic reports come into it, sort of specifically into the plot. Yeah. Because another criticism of him, or uh, is, the, is the sense no, no people, no interest, uh, no characters, and no plot. But uh, it's it's uh, or no plot as you understand character developing. In, um, but it's quite the reverse of that because there are there are lots of murders and potential murders, and. Um, things being investigated. I mean, could you, could you explain a bit how yeah. The Erasers works? So, yeah, it, it's almost, I mean, it's a, it can be read as a straight-up detective novel. Um, you know, somebody's been murdered, although it's not clear whether he has been murdered. And, um, and you get the detective, Wallace, kind of investigating, and there's all these duplications, and things get more and more complicated. But, but the city itself, which is never named, it's just, it's the polis, it's, it's, it's you know, civic space architecture space <laughs> on it so, and anyhow he, he just moves around it again and again the same patterns and then he comes across these kind of mise en abimes within space so there's like there's a, a stationary shop where he buys erasers and in that shop there's a wonderful scene where in the window they've got a dummy like a mannequin who's got up as an artist and the artist is painting a, a, the ruined city of Thebes and it's at a place where three roads meet it's blatant kind of Oedipus you know, appropriation. And anyhow, he's painting this Greek ruined city, but what's opposite him is a photograph of this real city that, that, that the whole thing is in now. So you get this kind of, you know, like on the Quaker's porridge oat package, where you get the Quaker holding the porridge oats in the package, holding the <laughs> porridge oats. You get this infinite, well, not infinite, but you get this regressive kind of thing in which the same thing is happening in and in and in. Um, and then at the end, the detective ends up committing the crime that he was investigating, just like Oedipus. In fact, he always already had committed it. He always already was going to have had committed it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like Oedipus. Mm. So there's this, this kind of shifting around of, of time and temporality. It starts moving in loops rather than in a straight line, which, you know, Rob Gray didn't invent. You get that in Beckett, you get it in Joyce, you know, you get it in Faulkner, who are people he admires massively. But, yeah. but he, he um, this is very much the kind of temporality that he 
that he's using the model of time rather than rather than a linear enlightenment one. Mm. But so the way you present it there is as though the the the, the crime comes before yeah. the geometry, as it were, before that. So the labyrinth is something that that's sort of involved in the myth. The um, murder found it grounds space. Yeah, yeah, and it's there underneath the city. Um, but I wonder in other books of his, um, I mean, the very usefully titled In the Labyrinth. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to it's very straightforwardly have very exciting, I mean, to, to the extreme of mise en abime. Yeah. Uh, so the soldier in the city will wander into a bar and there's a photo of a soldier in a bar that, and, and then that becomes the main narrative. And But but again, Pulse, it, it's not, I mean, you, you get similar things in, in Calvino, like Ivan a Winter's Night, but it's kind of cutesy and trite in Calvino and, and, and in Rob and in that book. And in Rob Gray, it's not. There's a, there's a consistent kind of pathological, um, repetitive, you know, force kind of running through it that just that accumulates more and more kind of intensity as as it goes on because he he's not skidding you and taking you in different places. He's just repeating the same thing differently every time at every possible level. It's like he's found every frequency on the dial and is transmitting through it. And yeah. you get all the interference and patterns and and that's the kind of that's the dynamism of of the work. Yeah. Um I suppose it would be good um to know a little bit about uh, when the, the, I mean, in the the idea of uh, 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 actually to jumping back a little bit. Sorry, um, you're talking about the 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 ellipsis. Yeah. Um, we we were talking about shapes. You were talking about the uh, the ellipse as being one of them, um, and among them are those those three dots that were in the. In the in the wife's the name, the ellipse, a dot yeah. dot dot the the bit that's missing, yeah. um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about how important that that the the thing that isn't there is in him. It's hugely important. So um, okay, so jealousy. What's in English called jealousy, la jalousie. In French, that means jealousy, but it also means the slap blind, you know, the the Venetian blind. So the whole book consists of a man looking at his wife, at the back of her neck as she writes something often through this jalousie, through this, this blind. So through the double blind of, of his jealousy mm. and, and the jalousie. And so, and, and the blind is, and, and this, the figure of the blind actually, it recurs in lots of his books. It's, it's one of his favorite kind of shapes or objects because it is geometric, right? It's a series of stripes, it's repetitive, and, and you look through it, but it also occludes things. It creates blind spots. Um, and this figure of, yeah, the blind spot, the ellipse, I mean, this is why I wanted to show those pictures of the, you know, the owl that you don't see looking back at you, because this is kind of the heart of his work, you know, the, the, and, 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 and so what, what happens in, in La Jalousie is initially the husband, the narrator, occupies the blind spot, because we never hear his name or see him do anything, it's just all, you know, he's like the, sh the thing in John Carpenter's Halloween, you're just kind of seeing, you see everything, he's like this kind of camera that shows you everything but the camera itself, you know? Mm. But then the, what happens as the book goes on is that A kind of moves into the blind spots and she becomes the powerful figure. And then by the very end of the book, who's in the blind spot is kind of the reader. I mean, A is writing in these letters initially to Franck, but then to someone else. You know, she's getting letters on the last post from Europe. It's a kind of meta-fictional bit where he's kind of saying that, you know, he's putting it back to the reader. You, you are the blind spot, you know, the owl is, is looking at you, buddy. Mm. <laughs> and he, in an interview with Hansel Rokobris that he did recently, he, he kind of talks about this. He says, he says the novels of Dickens or Balzac, I mean, they're great, but they don't really need readers because they do the reader's work already. <laughs> you know? Whereas his own novels very much need an active reader who's going to piece it together, like an airfix kit. You know, you need, it needs the person who's going to glue it all together. Um, Apart from his ones are more like an Ikea kit because there's always a bit missing, right? I mean, this, this, this <laughs> <laughs> <A> frustrating, <laughs> the frustrating, exactly. Screen. No, no, it's deliberately frustrating. But yeah. that the ultimate blind spot, I think, is is reading, which is why, again and again in his work, you know, you get it comes back to the material kind of accoutrements of writing, like erasers and pens, and even the dead insect that the centipede makes letters on the wall, mm. S's and question marks. It's typographic, you know. So in, in the, at the heart of all the at the heart of all the regressive space is literature, you know. So the 
and, and so that com comment he made in that interview, which was uh, w w which was he di he died in two thousand two thousand and eight, didn't he? Yeah, I think it was, it was about two years before yeah. or something. It was yeah. not not long before. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there he was at the end r railing against the the terrible situation of the of 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 contemporary literature and that psychological realism still had this mm -hmm. sway over things um but by putting literature in in the in the novels uh in that way you describe he also spent a lot of time really trying to redress the balance by writing essentially manifestos and yep. you mentioned the notes for a novel which a series of essays that yep. were, became became a book that um and i wonder i, I noticed in 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 it he he at one point says um trying to define what the n new novel was um and this i guess he was writing in the late 50s it was getting on for 1960 but said uh in in 1860 the new novel was flaubert in 1910 it was proust yeah uh and you know 50 years later 50 years 50 years later it's it's this is the new novel now, and uh, he explains it in some wonderful way. And if we've got time, we'll, it, we'll, we'll say what it is. But there's another 50 years have gone by. Uh, you think, you know, by rights, there should be a revolution in 2010. Yeah, but it didn't, didn't really happen. <laughs> <laughs> what went wrong? Yeah. Well, I don't know, you know, we forget that, you know, when Kafka published Metamorphosis, 11 copies sold, of which 10 were purchased by Kafka, right? So, I mean, it, it's not as though that was the Dickens of its day and everyone was reading Kafka and we've gone off the track since. I mean, I think, you know, it's not always the case that, that the important stuff is it has a tiny audience, but it usually is. I mean, it's not necessarily the case, but it just it kind of often is. Um, so, you know, I mean, Rob Grier has survived. He's on every MA literature course, you know, whoever... Who were the middle brow commercial writers of, you know, 1914 or whatever when Metamorphosis was published? We don't know and we don't care. And and uh, same with, um, you know, Rob Grier's kind of whatever middle brow contemporaries. I mean, I, I can't name any. So so although I mean I know he rails and he was angry that he wasn't a bestseller, but I mean, I, I think he he's you know his his kind of legacy and his importance is kind of guaranteed. You know. But one of the most impressive things about um about the manifestos really is that is that you you think well there can't possibly be a way out for the for for psychology or for the idea that there are that there will be but that, that the novel should be about uh, uh, uh somebody who looks a little bit like a real person who yeah. might be thinking this and that and have uh, this whole constructed depth of emotion yeah. yeah i mean he's very good you know he he has a project he's against naturalism he's against um sentimentalism he's against humanism um you know precisely well for very you know because because they're wrong aesthetically you know i mean then he again he's not the first person to to point this out you know i mean there's a wonderful passage by um ford maddox ford when he says you know consider the sentence on Thursday, I painted my fence. I mean, what rubbish, you know, on Thursday, I painted my fence. On Thursday, I woke up thinking of this. It made me think of this. My coffee pot was blue. I looked across, there was the neighbor who had an affair with, you know, this, or when Burroughs is describing the cut-up, he kind of says, you know, life is a cut-up. You don't walk down the street going, you know, as I walk down the street, comma, you know, I pondered the notion of, like in a Jane Austen novel, you know, you, you, you have impressions, there are, ellipses, synapses, you know, analepses, memory loops. Um, this, is, this is kind of what life is. So, and anyhow, I think Rob Greer is very much in, in that camp, you know, but someone like Proust is in that camp as well. And, 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 and he gets it and he's, but also he, he kind of understands, like he wants to place things like, um, so he's anti-naturalist, so he's, he wants to see, like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, he wants to see the mechanism behind the real, you know, and, and, he, and, 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 and he places that mechanism at the heart of the fiction and, and things like duplication and, you know, fakeness, counterfeit, you know, inconsistencies, artifice. These are not marginal embellishments. These are right at the heart, not just of his fiction, but of his kind of understanding of what reality is. Mm. And, and he's right. I mean, there's no two ways about it. You know, he's, this, is the, I, this is the way it is, and he's right. And... Um, this is his project. So, so I'm um, uh, sorry, I'm kind of ranting, but no. but, um, <laughs> but the, the kind of psychological, you know, 
realism that doesn't even know that it's a literary convention. Just, just I, I think that will always be the default mode. I mean, he was kind of optimistic. He thought it was just like a bad cold we hadn't shaken off, you know, that, that humanism had died, but the accoutrements were still there. But I, I think it's been kind of, in a zombie way, kind of revivified as the, as the cultural logic of kind of consumer capitalism, you know, <laughs> authenticity, be yourself, express yourself, you know, by Nike, you know, <laughs> Tony Blair can get off scot-free in front of the whatever inquiry it is just by saying I absolutely authentically in the depths of my conscience felt that this was the right thing to do, you know, and rather than, uh, you, you know, and they don't even hold him to account for the actual mechanics of what actually happened. I mean, I don't think this is conspiratorial. I think the dominant cultural logic of our time is 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 this kind of, yeah, the ideology of authentic authenticity and 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 you know individuals and uh, and the kind of depth of an individual and 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 Rob Gray's work you know completely rejects that and demolishes it again and again. You know, not just for the sake of doing it, but in order to kind of do something better. Yeah, but unfortunately, <laughs> well, I think that, that's always there as 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 an option for kind of artists, you know. And I think most most of the contemporary artists or writers or filmmakers, you know, who who really excite me are, are doing exactly that, you know. Hmm. Um, yeah, his, his interest. I mean, you 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 said in an introduction that you you wrote to 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 jealousy that um, that he's. The, the visual art is is influenced by him quite heavily, and um, and Phil. I mean, you you mentioned David Lynch, and the how how and what what do they take out of him, and how does it? Well, you see, Lynch is kind of interesting because I I don't even know if he's read Rob Greer. I mean, every time he he talks about his work, he he kind of talks all this weird hippie crap about catching big fish in your mind and stuff. And but you know, the work itself is really um, it seems to 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 have exactly the same kind of um, configuration, you know. I, I mean, I mentioned um, Lost Highway, which is so like the voyeur, you know, with, mm. with the jealous husband stalking the labyrinth of the house, the gaze, the murderous gaze, the dead woman, you know, the duplication, the splitting. And then, you know, Inland Empire, which is all about kind of labyrinthine duplications. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, Lynch, doesn't have to have read Rob Grier directly. I think I think there's a there's a kind of cultural logic that he's that he's plugging into that that you can trace. Yeah. You know that you can find elsewhere. I mean. Yeah. My my worry I think is that um, I, I know very little about the fields of v visual art, but that um, you know you may be being a bit optimistic, and that just in 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 literature in fiction, there much less has changed. Um, than one might have hoped, than he might have hoped. Uh, I mean, I think if you just look at the level of uh, sentences, one of the ways he talks about how the sort of infestation of humanism um, is is through is by looking at m metaphors and yeah. uh, there's that whole passage where he talks about uh, the fact that metaphors are never innocent. That yeah. you, if you say the the village huddled in the valley and the the majestic mountain it's you you everything's that, anthropomorphized yeah. there's this sort of uh implication of the sublime and exactly, man yeah, yeah. is somehow yeah. there before the talk, before the objects are yeah. ever present and um Oh, and the way he deals with that, I mean, that's that's he he seems to do it with amazing rigor, and there just aren't any metaphors in in wha what in in his in his writing at all. There are analogies, things that I mean, yeah. the, the, the spatial th things are compared yeah. between. But I wonder how, as you have gone about your fiction writing, you've dealt with the way. I mean, at what point do you think I've got to be careful about how? You know how far mm. uh, psychology creeps in without me knowing, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the psychology thing. I mean, I, I, I think, okay, Freud, right? <laughs> for for me, Freud, his legacy has absolutely nothing to do with psychology. I mean, psychoanalysis is just—it's a different thing. It's about the structures that we inhabit as humans that produce us, that produce meaning, and it's about the emergence of meaning in the world, 
you know, I mean, it's Freud by the end of his career is as much a, an ethnographer, an anthropologist, a kind of theorist, theorist of jellyfish repeating their primal trauma of photosynthesis with the sun. You know, this is the kind of stuff he's writing about and about the mind as a kind of mystical writing pad, you know, that children's toy that you write on the surface and then it's erased, but there's a mark sketch, underneath yeah. and then it, it can come back. And so he's talking about these kind of mechanical prostheses that, that, that make us, you know, and, and psychology seems to be a totally different thing, a kind of humanist discourse about you know, people's feelings or, or, or whatever, or, or, you know, it is, it's just a different field. And, and um, so I think, you know, this comes back to the first question about, you know, there's, there's no characters, there are no people, there are people everywhere. It's all about, it's not humanist, but it's about being human, the condition of, of, of being a desiring subject trapped in space with a relation to death. You know, yeah, yeah. This is this is kind of the essential stuff, and this is what Greek tragedy is about. It's what Heidegger writes about, and this is this is this is what this is exactly. I mean, Rob Gray has just kind of found a um, a hotline, a kind of quick way to the to the essentials of of this. Um, so so um, you know, you don't need psychology for there to be consciousness and affect you know, or, or desire, you know, that's one thing. In terms of the metaphors, I mean, I don't have that same problem. I know his whole strategy is, is kind of to be totally forensic and geometry only, mm. and he says that geometry avoids, you know, sublimation. But actually, I mean, if you were an academic, you could say, yeah, but what about like Pythagoras and Plato and stuff? I mean, There's geometry a was a route to metaphysics to yeah. sublimity for them. I mean, it's fine. This is the way he wants to kind of play it, and, and it works for him. But, you know, he rejects Francis Ponge, which is, is a real, I, I think he's wrong to do that. You know, he, he thinks, so Ponge is this wonderful uh, contemporary of his, who's a fantastic prose poet, who writes about objects. He, he would write about the table or an orange or a cigarette. And it's all metaphor. I mean, everything is metaphor for him. It, it, it's about, so the oyster shell is like a kind of, um, okay, so the, sorry, the orange is like a sun with its exploding sunset, sun, you know, flares and and then when you express it, which is squeezing it, there's this kind of ejaculation of seed and this pleasure shoots from it. And, but then there's a sense of disappointment and, and, and so on. And I mean, it, it's beautiful stuff. And, and Rob Gray thinks, oh, this is just sentimental, you know, sublime stuff. And I, I don't think it is at all. You know, Ponge is on the side of things. And, and Ponge's work is like Rob Gray's, always about a failure of, of the human appropriation of things. We can't assimilate things to us. It's like Wallace Stevens, you know, yeah. at the end, like, things merely are. The plum yeah. survives its poems. You know, there, there's just stuff, and we will never assimilate it to, to, to our kind of, um, to ourselves, to our individuality. Yeah. So in a way, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can, things can infect other things. You, you, can, er, you can eradicate that, the, 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 sort of the, the, un, the unconscious sort of things that reveal, reveal yourself and your, your but you... But um, I mean, it, actually, one thing when you when you mentioned the way Ponge works, reminds me. I, I, mean, I was thinking about your your metaphors, and um, at, at the b very beginning of C, you, I mean, you, 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 they they seem to work in a in a very special way. It seems to me. I think it's wonderful. Um, you have. Um, you've got this doctor arriving at this at the grand house, uh, going to deliver the. The heroes, the 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 the, 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 the hero. hero, in fact, is, and at the same time, there's vast quantities of copper wire at the back of it, the pony and trap, um, and the the man driving the pony and trap. You you hear you you have his leathery hands, reins woven through their fingers, um, and you sort of sort of think, oh well, you know, leathery hands. This is, uh, but there's this amazing consistency of everything through that passage and just throughout the book, the material, uh, all analogies are materials, in fact, other materials. Uh, at the end of that paragraph, you, you have higher, much further out, black birds whirr silently beneath a concave vault of sky. And at about that point, you think, you know, vault of sky, you know, this... this oh, it's, it's entering it's, the tomb, it's yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the pyramid, it's the crypt. Yeah. And yeah. The, by the end of the novel, that's, that's exactly where yeah. we are. There's um, a kind of regress through it. I mean, the mm. same thing repeats four times in, 
in C. I mean, back to the it going, getting more and more primal. I mean, one of the earliest Rob Greer books I read was Topology of a Phantom City, which is truly amazing. And again, you know, there's a kind of architectural, sorry, archaeological thing going on. You get this ruined city and an um, archaeologist digging up the woman's prison, but then you're in the woman's prison and there's a murder. And then you're in a theater and the murder's replayed. So you just get the same thing replayed I wouldn't say deeper and deeper because it's all surface, but like if you can imagine bits of acetate layered over each other, so it's still all surface, but there's multiple surfaces regressing. And and um, I thought that's a wonderful way to think about, you know, literature and what literature is. It's not about progress, it's about regress. You know, again, Oedipus, you know, the Greeks mm. knew this al already. You know? mm. So, um, yeah, no, that was a huge, a huge influence on, on C, definitely. And most strikingly, I suppose, um, in your first novel, Remainder, which is all about repetitions and trying to recreate uh, a memory that maybe half a memory or not, not exists. Yeah. Uh, the hero kind of tries to recreate a house that he vaguely remembers. Or he's had this kind of Proustian collage memory that he knows is a collage, but it stands in, it stands for an absolutely authentic memory. And the hero is obsessed with authenticity and wanting to be authentic. So he hires people. He's got a lot of money. He hires people to kind of, he has the house built and he hires people to move around it in a way that's consistent with his idealized kind of platonic memory. And of course, it, they never get it right. And then he has it replayed and changed and everything spirals more how and much more. Of, how much of that novel were you aware of having, you know, learned things from Rob Grier? Oh, with very much. I mean, totally. It was a hugely... Um, this, I hadn't actually read Jealousy then, but I'd, I read it, I think, immediately after I finished Remainder. Um, but, you know, I was thinking of the voyeur, totally, this, mm. this kind of, because at the heart of Remainder, again, is, is a violent event, which you don't see, you don't even know what it is. But by the end, he's kind of creating it. I mean, he's producing the violent event that started the whole thing. So it's moving in this kind of loop, this repetition loop. And... Um, and these kind of inconsistencies, like there's a scene in the voyeur. So in the voyeur, you know, you get this... There's a lot of time in it. I mean, the guy sells watches and, and um, he's going around an island selling watches. It's all about time. He's a purveyor of time. But time is, is like kind of doubling itself and, and duplicating itself and overlapping. So you'll get a scene narrated before it's happened and then seven pages later it happens or you get the replay of it but it's a bit different and there's an inconsistency and then it hasn't happened. And all throughout the book, he's carrying in his pocket a newspaper report of the murder that he will then do in the book. You know, so again, the event is pre-announced like Oedipus' murder of his dad. Um, and, uh, but I was, you know, th there's a wonderful scene in it where, or two scenes, he goes into a bar and, and there's a young woman serving there and she's nervous and she doesn't pour the right amount and she looks kind of put upon. And then about 50 pages later, the scene is replayed. But this time, there's an old woman who's been doing it all her life, and she can kind of go, fush, fush, you know, and, and pour the whiskey, and it comes exactly to the rim, and it forms this perfect menings, and she doesn't even need to look. And, and then the prose breaks down, and the young woman comes back in, and then the old woman, and the young woman, and the sentences break. And I mean, if you want to kind of reverse engineer it into a kind of psychological novel, you can say, OK, well, he's, he's psychotic. He's going mad, which you know, isn't entirely wrong, but I think it's it, it's just about, you know, this kind of wonderful set of of repetitions. Like Deleuze says, the only thing you can actually repeat is difference, right? So it's it's the differentiated kind of repetition. And and when I was writing Remainder, I, I kind of stole that scene. I mean, there's a scene in the bar where the waitress is shifting and it's it's a kind of direct tribute to to Rob Grey to that scene, I guess. Yeah. But in a way the whole the whole book is is hugely infused with, you know, with it's all about repetition and violence and repetition and violence and yeah <laughs> well i think um we should let people ask some questions if they if they'd like to ask tom it's very interesting the um got a question about this idea of quantification in regards to the measurements of tables and the sort of forensic idea of measurement um in one camp and the psychological and the sentimental and humanist in another um it seems to me that they're both sort of aesthetic interpretations or ways to deal with the looseness of language or the sort of sacred abyss that we hover above language with. Um, but I don't see really a displacing, one displacing all the other. When you deal with um, Heidegger and uh, he talks about dwelling in the world, nearness isn't measured. It's an emotional 
psychological disposition of which sometimes you come into a clearing and it becomes clearer or sometimes it becomes more obscure but he certainly sees science as having a, a place but it's not uh, certainly as an anchor so what so what's the question no i mean that this is true but what what so what so are you saying that there you can have both yeah Anything goes. <laughs> I mean, it's just, um, yeah, it's not so much a question. It's, um, it just seems that there seems, uh, there's an aesthetic bias. I think it's political, ultimately. I mean, do you want art to assert an ideology of the self, of the individual, of authenticity? Or do you want it to, to, to an assert uh, uh, an aesthetic of abjection in front of space? Can, uh, yeah, you know, it can I mean, assert and, what and it wishes. Both of these can be made to work. I mean, I think... The second yeah, it's a kind of an first, instrumentalism, but, I mean, but, but it, it's ultimately political. I mean, it's like is 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 art there to kind of confirm, like be a vanity mirror for kind of liberal culture to see itself in the way it wants to see itself, or is it there to disrupt? It can be either. It can disrupt. It can be political, but it it, it can be put on trial if you wish, uh, you know, under mitigating circumstances. But essentially, it's um. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, I just don't think it's a question of metaphor being guilty any more than measurement. I'm, I'm pro-metaphor. <laughs> I'm totally, I'm pro-metaphor. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, yeah. I know Rob Gray has this anti-metaphor thing. I, I, we, can't, we can't defend him on that. I can't, anyhow. <laughs> I'm pro-metaphor, pro-metaphor that knows what it's doing. I think that's the... Derrida is a much better reader of Ponge than, than Rob Gray is. He, he gets it. And, and, the, and the kind of, the, the totally base material, anti-metaphysical... Um, movements of, of metaphor, you know. Sure, I mean, the desert in the desert, the other of the other, it's all metaphor, isn't it? You know? Yeah, but he has a specific book on, on Ponge called Signé Ponge, which is very... I uh, surprising he never wrote about Rob Gray. It's all about paraphs and signatures and remainders and matter and... and um, but I think he, he gets Ponge much, much better than, than Rob Gray does. Last year in Marienbad, well, it's a total masterpiece. I mean, it's just this brilliant, brilliant film. So, so um... What can we say? I mean, Rob Gray made it with Alain René in, I don't know, 50-something. And uh, it's about a, a hotel, Mariansky Lazny, in, in the Czechoslovakia, this, this spa where you get these grandiose corridors. And the first 10 minutes of the film is just this monologue about the corridors as the camera moves down the corridors that kind of quasi-repeat. And then you get mise en abimes, you get pictures of the whole of the chateau in, on the wall. And, and then there's a play being enacted and it's not clear whether the monologue is from the play or if it's a voiceover in the film. And, and then at the heart of it is, is, um, is a love story, I guess. I mean, this man is saying to this woman, you were here last year, we had an affair, we were, you were gonna run away with me. And she says, I've never been here before, I don't know you. And, and it's not clear what's true and, and in fact, the decision the, the the woman has to make by the end of the film is what will have been true. <laughs> she she answers the uh, the appeal. You know, she says, "Yes, I love you. This this is this is all true. Let's let's do it. Let it have been true." This is this is the thing. You can have you can have love without sentimentalism. I think you know there's a there's a huge amount of of, of passion in Rob Grier's writing. In fact, it's nothing but passion. It's raw. You know, it's it's all about desire moving through space and animating it, and um, and this is yeah. Last year in Marion is a kind of great example of that. Do you think he quite pulls it off in terms of his theory and the execution of his literature? Because I came across the literature before I came across the theory, and one of the things I was very impressed by in his writing was um, the way that description, uh, and there is an awful lot of description in his work then becomes story. And when you look at his um, theory of his manifesto, a lot of it is about not imbuing the world with meaning. The world isn't there available for, to communicate with us. But in some sense, all the descriptions of objects do result in a story there. There's always a story, yeah. even in the description of the objects. Yeah, but when, when it, I, I know the bit you're talking about in his... Um, in, um towards a new novel and he, he uses that forensic analogy and he says if you're a detective you come into a murder scene there's all these objects you interrogate them so that they'll deliver up a meaning like what happened but then you know things get more complex than that 
the objects are excessive to that meaning you're trying to get from them or they produce too many meanings and at the end they're just recalcitrantly there, you know. And then later he talks about Beckett's work and the way Beckett's characters, there's no transcendent kind of meaning that makes them meaningful. They're just there, kind of uselessly there. And, uh, and I, I, th I, think, I think there is a kind of consistency with, with um, between the theory and the, and the practice with with Rob Grier, um in that respect, you know. But I think I think the violence thing is, is just really, really important. That there is a there isn't a transcendent, you know, it doesn't provide a transcendent meaning, but it provides a kind of a timeline and a structure and a, a kind of archaeology of of presence in its temporal sense as well. You know, the present moment has been produced by some ur crime, which we will never see and never recover. We can reenact it or reproduce it. But I, th I think objects are kind of corralled together and made meaningful in his work through through that. Uh, you spoke uh, really <laughs> very effusively and uh, about Rob Grier's early work, and you mentioned uh, topology of a phantom city at one point. It's very rare to hear people. Uh, <laughs> it's out of print. It's so carefully. hard to find. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, so Rob Grier's um, changes direction dramatically in the late 1960s, moving towards more erotic violence in his work, in his films, and in his books, I suppose. And could you say something firstly about that change of direction, but secondly about the reception of that and the effect that it's had on his reputation? Because one of the reasons I came here is because it's very rare to, <laughs> to hear people talk about Rob Grier today, because his reputation seems to have suffered a lot since the 1970s and the rise of feminism and that critique that began. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the right person to answer that. I mean, y there are academics who know who can who know know exactly when he wrote what and what the reception was, and you know, I, I read them and I couldn't even tell you what order they're written in correctly now, probably, and and so on and so on. I mean, I have a much more kind of subjective response to it, or or rather, I read it and think, how can I steal that? You know, how can I <laughs> how can I how can I do that? How can I make my you know what what can I do with this? Um, but. Uh, yeah, certainly there was. He did become a, a bit of a bête noire, and and uh, with the whole, um, there is in his work a, a, a rep repetitive sexual violence. You know, usually with a woman as a victim, but you know, so is there in Ingeborg Bachmann as well. I mean, she she's a she's a kind of quite interesting counterpart. I mean, when she writes, I mean, she's brilliant. You know, when when she writes it in Malina. It, it, it's a, it's a critical commentary on the way society works. When he writes it, you get the sense there is a lot more of kind of, he's more on the side of the perpetrator, <laughs> maybe. There's, a, there's an identification. The narrative voice tends to be identified more with the perpetrator than the victim. You know, but they're both um, sketching the contours of a, of a kind of, of the same kind of, um, you know, Bachman writes at every periphery a woman murdered. I mean, it's the same in Rob Grier. I mean, the, it, this is this is the way culture is configured. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know that that one could just kind of write it off for not being, um, you know, f f for representing that. You know, I mean, this this is what he's about. You know, there's a phrase in Topology of the of Phantom City. He talks about the endless. The endless cycle of violence and representation in the woman in the woman's prison. It's like he's almost seen the primal scene of of Western culture. I think the difference between him and Bachman is he he likes it. <laughs> I've never read any uh, Rob Gray books, but I have seen the film. But I just wondered, how does he deal with love? Does he? You mentioned that he does deal with it. Does he see it as any kind of answer to the primal violence? That's no, it's the cause of it. <laughs> it's, it's the cause of it and the consequence of it and the um, the thing that perpetuates it. The violence causes love and the love causes violence and uh, it's an endless circle and there is no redemption from it at all. It, it's uh, certainly not in literature. Yeah, his way of seeing it is probably, I mean, what did, what did Nabokov say about jealousy? Nabokov said of, of uh, jealousy, this is the, the best novel about love since Proust. And uh, you know, I think squash he's caterpillars. You yeah, know. no, I think I think he's he's probably right. You know, interestingly, actually, Nabokov. He he. Um, I saw years ago a, a reproduction of his edition of or the op the inset page of of you know the the title page of of Nabokov's edition of Austin's Northanger Abbey, and the first thing he did 
to, to kind of unpack that book was to do a um, to draw its floor plan which is exactly what in fact in the English edition of La Jalousie you, that, that's what you get on the front page is I don't know if it's in the original French I, I haven't know. read it in, in the original but um it's kind of interesting kind of parallel there as well mm. Nabokov's also obsessed with memory mm. and uh, yeah recovering uh, just wondering whether you'd read any of his work in French yeah, I read, I, read, um, I read about half of La Reprise in French um, and uh, Topology and um, I think that's about it. So, I mean, I, I think with, with him, it, it, he, I, I, don't, I don't think he's someone that loses much in the translation. I mean, it's not, there aren't these kind of Joyce and associative linguistic clusters and, and word plays. I mean, it, it's so flat and descriptive that it actually, um, it almost doesn't matter what language it's in. It's not about the richness of, of sounds or whatever. But Although, of course, there, there are very precise you know. <laughs> correspondences that like, of, of exactly that kind. That, yeah. Um, did you have, do, was there something you wanted to, to say following on from that? that, that well, not really. It was a different question altogether. But since the first was quick, can I ask another quick <laughs> The, the later novel, you, his last novel wasn't La Reprise, it was uh, Roman Sentimental. Oh, God, yeah, and about schoolgirls in miniskirts. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I yeah, haven't which read wasn't, it. well, it hasn't been translated yet, so that would make sense. But um, I'm sorry you haven't read it because it, it, to me, it seems to me that in that novel he moves into sentimentality, as he did in his last film. He started becoming sentimental in his work. You didn't see his last film? No, like no, Mativa. neither. Uh, no, yes, the one, he showed it at the Serpentine a few yes, years ago. Yes, he did, yes. Yeah, I didn't see all of it. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that says about it. What disturbed you about it that made you leave? Or did you have a date? <laughs> it just, I don't know, it just wasn't... I mean, the thing with repetition, you know, Borges says it's every artist, it's every writer's curse to become his own worst imitator. And this is, um, this is a problem. This happens to people, you know. They, they, they establish something and they repeat it less and less well. Um, with someone like Rob Grier or, or Ballard, where the re or, or Warhol, you know, where the repetition is the content in a way, or is a large part of it, they can kind of get away with that, but but I I, I don't know. I, I did get the impression that it 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 seemed to be slightly. It just wasn't doing it for me. It seemed to be re rehashing a, a, some some things that you know had become hackneyed or, almost. Um, I just wondered in uh, his manifesto, uh, he talks quite a lot about Balzac and really rejects the idea of um, you know the the predestination, all that kind of thing, and that, um, with the problem with narration and third-person narration being implying that something's destined to happen. How is that kind of reconciled with this Oedipal idea in some of the novels that you were talking about and the idea that, that this some, there was something already in the text that was rewritten? Is that not a slight contradiction there? It is. I mean, he's really equivocal on the whole question of tragedy. He's totally anti-tragedy in his in towards a new novel, you know, be because of its Christian, redemptive, Hegelian, blah 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 aspect. And yet, you know, he's haunted by tragedy, and he's endlessly paying tribute. So in the Erasers, you know, I mean, it, uh, there's the Rue de Cohant, the Rue de Thebes. You know, the Corinth and Thebes is the place where three roads meet. There's the Riddle of the Sphinx. You know, he he's 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 clearly you know throughout his work there's blindness. There's um. You know, he, he's, he loves Faulkner. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of... He's in dialogue with tragedy the whole time. I mean, I think maybe his answer to that is kind of comedy. I mean, comedy would be tragedy without the transcendence, which is why he loves Beckett. I mean, you get the same abjection, the same kind of being trapped, the same sense of time and decay, but there's no solution, there's no kind of way out. And... and um, so, so there's, there is a kind of, there's a, there's a tension, I think. There is a contradiction there in his work. And also, I mean, another thing, I, I, I don't think he gets, I think he uses Balzac and Flaubert as kind of straw men. And lots of other people do this as well. They say, well, the realist novel, which has come out of Balzac and Flaubert. And whenever I read that, I think, hang on a minute. Like, you know, Flaubert wrote Bouvard and Pecachet, which is about two guys 
you know, reenacting gestures from the front cover of books in order to try and be authentic and failing, and then it dissolves into this dictionary of received ideas that we don't even know who wrote it. It's totally anti, or, or you know, Balzac wrote, wrote Saracene, which Roland Barthes, you know, rightly holds up as the kind of absolute apogee of, 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 a, of a kind of critique of authenticity and, you know, at the heart of what seems to be naturalist and natural is just a series of endless duplicates and copies. There's a void of a regressive void of... So Saracene, you know, is, is about this guy that falls in love with what he thinks is a genuine woman and it's actually a transvestite, i.e. a copy of a copy of a blah, blah, blah. And so, I, you know, things don't map out that neatly. I mean, I think, I think I'd go even further than Rob Greer and say, you know, there never was such thing as a realist novel. You know, realism was always a literary convention as fraught with artifice as any other. And, and, uh, and I don't think there is a year zero at which realism kind of ends. I think, I think, I think it never actually began. And, um, and the wonderful thing about, one of the many wonderful things about Rob Grier is, is that he, he makes this fact absolutely inescapable. You know, there's no, there's no hiding place back into the natural, the authentic. I mean, it's, that ground is gone, so we're just confronted with, you know, the challenge of, of how to manage being, time, death, and representation, which is what the novel has always had to do and, and needs to do. <laughs> Is that a more positive ending? Uh, <laughs> Still didn't like his last <laughs> film, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.